Hello and welcome to our Field Focus Emergency Medical Services Edition. My name is Mr. Foss. I started off my career in EMS as an EMT. I then became a paramedic and I've been one ever since. Uh, I've been kind of all over the state of North Dakota and I've most recently been on the flight paramedic side of things uh, here in Fargo. I'm now teaching at Cheyenne, obviously. Uh, but if you didn't have any of my classes, you may not have known that. So let's start off with the symbol that you may recognize here. It's an, an EMS symbol, pretty universally used. Um, uh, we're starting off at the top and going clockwise. Um, you won't normally see the, the definitions on there, but uh, starting off with detection. So detecting that there's a medical emergency occurring or uh, some sort of emergency situation uh, and then reporting. So you typically that's a 911 system and then response. So responding with the appropriate resources. Uh, in a medical situation, that would obviously be an ambulance, uh, but determining what care level and uh, who exactly you need in the ambulance. Uh, some are basic life support, some are advanced life support. We'll get into a little bit as we move on. Uh, it could also incorporate the fire department, uh, law enforcement, public works, uh, whatever the uh, situation requires. Uh, and then on-scene care, that is the medical care given uh, by the EMTs or EMS personnel on the scene of the incident or the event. And then care in transit is the health care uh, on the way to the hospital. Uh, and then transfer to definitive care. So handing off to uh, a nurse or a physician in a hospital setting. So what is EMS? EMS is a, is a system, a public health system that provides medical care in the event of emergencies to uh, all of the critically sick and or injured. So all the all the, the worst possible scenarios, um, that's what EMS is built for to handle. Um, this is a coordinated response and it involves a lot of moving parts, a lot of highly trained professionals, uh, both in the private and public sector. So you could be looking at um, public figures such as public works or the fire department or law enforcement um, being the public side of things. You could have uh, EMS based at a fire station, so ran out of a fire department. Uh, you could also have uh, separate ambulance services that can be either uh, owned by the government or owned by a private individual, and these can be either for-profit or not-for-profit. Uh, but either way, they, they operate ve very similar in coordination with one another. So with that, there, there's a lot of need for communication and transportation networks. So radios and phones uh, and ways to communicate with uh, each different uh, entity and agency. Uh, these could include trauma systems as well as hospitals, specialized trauma centers, uh, any kind of specialty care center. Rehab facilities would also fall into that. Uh, EMS professionals can be volunteer or paid. Uh, you can be a volunteer status or be make it a career like I did for pre-hospital uh, emergency medical setting. You can also, it also involves physicians uh, EMS providers need a what's called a medical director. The medical director is a doctor that says, here's what I want you to do medically for these uh, wide range of, of emergencies that you could come into contact with. This medical director also makes sure that uh, the EMS professionals are properly trained um, and continue to be properly trained in how that uh, particular physician wants the different skills performed. Uh, nurses and, and therapists will also play a support role and, and also receive patients from EMS uh, professionals. Uh, administrators and government officials, EMS uh, was born as a government, uh, United States government uh, body, as a need to help uh, protect people uh, from car accidents originally, and it kind of grew from there. Also a big part of what EMS does is public information. A lot of times the emergency rooms and the EMS providers, along with the fire department and and other emergency responders like law enforcement are the first to recognize that there is a public health problem or uh, a pattern forming and also can play a very important role in, in public education to, to point out these continuing problems in public health. Uh, for example, I will, I'll go back to my car exa or accident example. Um, knowing that seat belts were saving lives uh, and not wearing one was causing a lot of lost life and, and additional injury. Um, EMS professionals noticed that first being the ones that uh, were there. So EMS professional, law enforcement, fire department. 
So the different EMS licensure levels, there are four recognized levels that have changed over the years, but here's what they currently are. We're looking at EMR or emergency medical responder. This was formerly known as first responder. It is now EMR. And then EMT or emergency medical technician, this was shortened. Uh, it used to be referred to as EMT basic or emergency medical technician basic. They got rid of the basic uh, and moved on to a, AEMT or advanced emergency medical technician. Um, this used to have two separate settings, which were a little confusing. So they simplified the advanced emergency medical technician and then ending up with paramedics. So paramedic would be um, the kind of end game for training levels uh, for the EMS side of things. And each one has its, its own role. Each one has its own kind of specialty in um, what they're trained to do. And we'll get into that as we move forward. So starting with the emergency medical responder, like I mentioned before, this is like a first responder. So you wouldn't typically as an EMR be in an ambulance type setting or really in a specific healthcare setting at all. Usually you would have an emergency medical responder as um, somebody in the community that's interested in, in helping or, or knowing what to do in the event of an emergency. You may also uh, get EMR certified for a job, say you work um, far away out in the country, something like that, or in a dangerous field, having an EMR on the job site um, could be beneficial as well. Or if you're into adventures or something, it might be something that you do personally, that you like to go hiking and being medically trained to know what to do in the event of emergency before um, other EMS personnel with a, a full toolkit show up. So uh, they must complete an approved EMR course uh, and then typically these courses are two to four weeks. You can find differing lengths, but what they go off of is number of hours spent in the classroom and training. So typically you're looking at 55 to 65 hours for an approved EMR course. After you uh, have finished that EMR course, uh, you go through and you challenge a cognitive and psychomotor test. So the, the cognitive is just a written test that you take. Um, typically it's a multiple choice type setting. And then the psychomotor test just tests the skills uh, needed to perform at that level. So typically this is something simple like how to stop bleeding effectively, um, how to immobilize somebody um, and keep them immobilized safely before EMS or an ambulance or fire uh, department can arrive to assist. This training level, you are not required to be 18 years old as opposed to the, the ones as we move forward, the EMTs and so on. Um, so this is a good starting point if you're under 18 and you're interested in, in becoming um, certified as an EMT or higher in the future, uh, this would be a, a good first step for base of knowledge. Also, with any uh, EMS professional, you have to hold and maintain certification as a, uh, in CPR as a healthcare provider, which is a little bit uh, more in depth than uh, you've taken if you're not a healthcare provider. So only healthcare providers would take that classification of CPR, but um, you also need to uh, renew that every two years. And then into emergency medical technician. So here you do have to be 18 years old as opposed to the EMR, but uh, similar to that, you must complete an approved EMT course. Uh, this one's a bit longer. So you could, you could have them as short as three weeks. This is, they, sometimes they refer to them as boot camps. Now I don't recommend boot camps because an EMT is, is kind of a, a big responsibility. This is the first initial training level to where you can be alone in the back of an ambulance with a patient. So an EMR would not be able to do that, uh, but an EMT would be able to run a basic life support ambulance um, by themselves as, as the uh, sole caregiver. Obviously they would need a, a driver, but all, all you need for certification to drive the ambulance uh, is a CPR card and a driver's license. So you could uh, function on your own in the back as an EMT. Uh, this takes 120 hours of training. So that three weeks to get 120 hours, you're probably looking at pretty close to full-time um, attendance in class and, and training. Uh, but typically they're longer than that. 11 weeks would be a little bit closer. Um, they are adding, or they have been adding a lot of stuff to the curriculum throughout the years. So it's, it's becoming harder and harder to do it in such a short amount of time but it is possible. Uh, but in the end, you do wanna be good at it. So you, the longer you can train and, and practice, the better you're going to be. So I, I definitely, if you're interested, I definitely recommend 
uh, the full blown course and not the 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 boot camps that are available. Those boot camps, in my opinion, are more geared to, towards other health professionals that uh, already have a, a solid base knowledge in healthcare, but maybe want to to uh, find their way into the back of an ambulance from time to time. So this would be uh, those boot camps would be great for something like uh, a nurse that already has training but wants to also function as an EMT. And now into our advanced emergency medical technician. So to become um, an AEMT, you first need to be a, an EMT and hold that certification. That will potentially get you into an approved AM, AEMT course. Uh, from there, you'll need additional 350 hours of training. That 350 hours um, is kind of, it gets to be kind of a lot, uh, but the amount of procedures and skills that are necessary at the AEMT level um, makes it worthwhile. So now you're you're able to do things with your AEMT um, that are more invasive. So you can do some some uh, airway management, insertion of airway devices, uh, as well as some injections and uh, some limited medication administration, and then uh, some IV initiation as well and some fluid initiation. So now you're looking at uh, some pretty, like I said, pretty invasive skills being performed at this level. Uh, and as the others, you do have to take a written cognitive test and the psychomotor skills test uh, to prove that you are able to do those things, um, both at the EMT level that you've already proved uh, and then uh, the advanced things at the AEMT level. And now paramedic. So paramedic training uh, brings you to the top of the EMS uh, world as far as uh, skills they allow you to perform and knowledge they expect you to have. Uh, to get into a paramedic program, you will need to already hold EMT certification or AEMT certification. Uh, they used to allow you in and um, train you to the EMT level first and then start the paramedic training. Uh, however, I, I do think that that went away. Um, I, do, I do not recommend uh, getting into a program without obtaining EMT certification first. Um, me personally, that's the route I went. Um, I, I went the EMT route first, worked as an EMT, and that uh, year or two of experience as an EMT, um, both before paramedic school and during paramedic school, was extremely valuable. So if, if you're considering a career or becoming a paramedic and you want to be a good one, I highly recommend becoming an EMT first. Becoming a good EMT first um, will be extremely beneficial. What you find out uh, at the paramedic level doing all the advanced things is that the basic skills that you learn as an EMR and an EMT, um, the, the real basic stuff, that is the real life-saving things. Granted, there is a time and a place for the advanced procedures, but that the real basic stuff needs to come first. And we find out that, that that's is what's saving a majority of um, lives in the EMS world. So get that EMT certification first to give you a good base of knowledge and skill set to build from at, in paramedic school. Uh, but as always, you must complete an approved paramedic course. You will need uh, proof that you've uh, finished that course in order to challenge uh, the test at the end to obtain your official certification and your license. So um, it is typically a two-year program, whether it, if you go to um, attend classes during the summer months, it might be a little short, but you will end up doing the same amount of hours. So you will end up with 1,200 to 1,800 hours, depending on your program. Um, and if you choose, a lot of places now are, are offering a two-year associate level degree. Four-year degrees are possible. Uh, I believe right now, um, without traveling, there's a couple that do it in person, but you are able to do a four-year bachelor program in EMS um, online. That doesn't necessarily qualify you to do more things in the ambulance. That would be something that people are um, doing to get into more of a managerial Gerial role. And also you do have to be certified in CPR and there are a couple of others, uh, advanced courses like ACLS or advanced cardiac life support and things like that, that you need to renew every two years. Uh, <clears throat> very similar to the CPR that you guys have probably taken in the past. So like I mentioned, paramedic is the top uh, training level in the EMS world. However, there are some additional certifications if you want to call them specialties that you can pursue as a paramedic. Uh, the first one I'll talk to you about is a certified community paramedic or CPC. 
So this would be a paramedic that uh, is employed typically by a hospital. And the idea here, which is a fairly new one, is that um, doctors that used to make house calls are now using paramedics to do the same thing. And the goal here um, would be to stop patients from needing to make an emergent trip back to the hospital. So um, the idea being that patient has a significant surgery or, or medical procedure or problem, but are allowed to go home and don't need to stay overnight in the hospital, um, the community paramedics role would be to make the house call in, in place of the doctor and be the eyes and the ears um, with their on-scene skills that they've developed as a paramedic and being able to identify things and being familiar with um, coming into people's homes uh, and, and performing those procedures. So this would be something like checking wounds um, to make sure that the healing process is, is, is occurring appropriately, um, check to make sure patient is taking medications, make sure there's no problems or issues. And the, the whole goal is to avoid um, unnecessary trips back to the hospital and to make sure patients are complying like they're supposed to with their uh, treatment plan. And then we have uh, Certified Critical Care Paramedic or CCPC. Uh, the critical care paramedic course is designed and certification is designed to focus on the advanced procedures that paramedics have to do, the really invasive procedures that uh, some services or medical directors will, will not allow to happen because they're so uh, potentially dangerous uh, and also because they don't happen very often and uh, they don't want them to be performed um, out of a hospital setting, which typically is, is kind of an uncontrolled environment compared to the hospital. Uh, the next is Certified Flight Paramedic, uh, or FPC. Uh, the, the Flight Paramedic Certification um, focuses on uh, the science of changing altitude and how that affects patients' uh, conditions. So a lot of different things can, can happen medically um, if someone is, is critically sick or injured with changing of altitude and air pressures and things. Um, and also loading and unloading is a little bit different. So the FPC focuses on some of those aspects and also some of the more intricate aspects of ICU medicine. So paramedics don't always function uh, in the ICU or, or use uh, a lot of those, the tools that are typically in a hospital setting, uh, they use more of ER based tools. So uh, the, the FPC would focus on uh, getting the paramedic up to speed with um, the things I mentioned before with the changing in altitude and the the tools and knowledge that an ICU, say, nurse or, uh, would need to function in the ICU. Uh, next is the certified tactical paramedic and certified tactical responder. So these would be certifications geared towards preparing you for uh, medical treatment uh, in the battlefield situation. So whether that be in a, in a wartime situation uh, or in something more like a SWAT team type of role. Um, and then lastly, we have wilderness certification. Uh, there's different wilderness uh, medical companies that will offer certifications, uh, but this is geared toward just what it sounds, perform, being able to perform uh, necessary medical procedures and, and uh, rescues uh, in the wilderness that's far away from tip or typical resources that you would have in EMS like an ambulance. So places that an ambulance can't go, a helicopter can't land, you know, how do you get patient out of the six mile hike they took up the mountainside. This would be a certification designed for that. Some of the skills that is necessary at the, uh, for minimum level um, paramedic would be uh, airway and breathing, we'll start there. Endotracheal intubation is a, is a, is a big skill that is necessary uh, in proficiency for the paramedic. So what this involves is taking a, a, a metal tool um, with a curve on it. Uh, I guess there could be a flat blade as well, but um, Basically, it's a piece of metal that goes into the patient's mouth uh, with a light on the end, and it, it is used to elevate the jaw away from the face to get a good uh, visualization so you can see the patient's trachea. Um, the idea being that we're gonna put a tube with a balloon on the end that can inflate into the patient's trachea that goes to the lungs as opposed to the esophagus that goes to the stomach, uh, into the trachea, inflate the balloon, and that gives a, a, a seal. So nothing that we don't intentionally put in patient's lungs down the tube can get in there. And that's especially valuable if patient uh, isn't awake enough uh, to know that they have vomited or that they are bleeding or whatever the case may be to not get things down into the lungs that we don't want in there. We can also use it to uh, control uh, breathing rate and volume. So how much air goes in and out and how fast it goes in and out. 
Uh, controlling patients' airway is definitely one of the specialties of, of EMS and, and being a paramedic. Uh, so uh, being able to breathe for somebody uh, outside of the hospital setting uh, is, is an important necessary skill. Uh, there is a lot of risk involved in that, it, it, as you can probably hear. Um, you're putting a piece of metal in someone's mouth and, and you're lifting, you're moving their jaw and they have, a lot of times they have teeth um, that, that can be damaged if you, if you don't do it properly. And then if you insert into the um, stomach, that can cause issues as well. So you need to be accurate with your tube placement and, and very careful with the use of your um, pressure that you're putting inside the patient's mouth uh, during the procedure. But again, very important. Uh, and now we have percutaneous cricothyrotomy. So this would be um, another airway management technique. Uh, instead of uh, using the patient's mouth to access the trachea, we're actually creating a hole in the patient's throat. So um, we're using a, a needle and we're going into the space right below where the Adam's apple would be. And there's a little, right below that, it's kind of a little hole and there's a little, another little ring underneath the hole. So within that hole, between the ring and the, the Adam's apple, there's a space there. So that's where the needle would go. And the needle creates a hole for the tube. So the needle comes out, the tube stays in, and that is your, your access to the patient's trachea. And the esophagus is behind that, right? So we know that we have secured access um, to move air in and out, and it kind of performs a very similar function to the endotracheal tube that I spoke about just a second ago. But now we're actually creating a hole. So there is um, some significant risk there uh, uh, for doing it if you do it inappropriately, um, so that you need to prove your proficiency there, uh, but also can be a, a life saving intervention. It does not happen very often. Okay. And then now we move into the uh, decompression of the pleural space. So decompression. Um, is just releasing of air, trapped air within the body. So here we're talking the pleural space, so the space between your lung and your chest wall. So if I have a hole in my lung, but not a hole in my chest wall, let's say, I breathe in and air escapes from the hole in my lung and can't get back into the hole, right? So it accumulates between the, uh, the lung and the chest wall. And it's trapped in there and it, I can't exhale it. And the more that accumulates, the more it pushes the organs, your heart and your lungs, over to the other side as more and more air and more and more pressure builds up. That's called a pneumothorax, and eventually uh, the severity of it causes what's called a tension pneumothorax. So it's ten there's tension inside your chest, and it's actually compressing uh, your vital organs uh, in your chest. And so what needs to happen is that air needs to come out of there. Right, but there's no there's no way of getting the air out without creating a hole in the chest. So that's what ends up needing to happen. You take a fairly large, long needle and you make a hole uh, into the patient's chest, uh, and it creates a, an escape valve for that trapped air. Um, it, it's very um, it can happen very quickly. And the harder the more shorter breath the patient gets, the harder they try to breathe in, which makes the problem worse. So that needle is definitely a life-saving uh, intervention. Uh, you will need uh, placement of a chest tube, which is a larger, more permanent fixture um, that is stays in the patient's chest while the lung tissue can heal in the correct location and the patient can continue to breathe normally while they heal. Um, but that, that would be something more on the critical side or um, preferably done in a contr more controlled setting. Um, we won't get into, into the ins and outs of that uh, here and now. But uh, pretty similar is the gastric uh, decompression. Uh, that refers to gas that is accumulated in the stomach. So now we're not poking a hole with a needle this time to, to have that air escape. We're going to go down through the esophagus. So either through the nose or the mouth with a long tube that goes all the way down into the stomach and stays um, out of the mouth and nose, and that gives the air a place to escape from. So you're thinking, if you're thinking, why would there be so much air in a patient's stomach? How is that possible? Well, a lot of times it occurs from artificial ventilation. So when we breathe for somebody, let's say before one of those endotracheal tubes is placed or some other, a crike or some other uh, definitive airway management has occurred and we're using those masks that go around the patient's nose and around their chin, 
and then squeezing the bag to force air in, that can work for an extended amount of time. Uh, however, some air can and tends to uh, make its way into the esophagus, uh, especially if you're doing it inappropriately, it, it can accumulate even faster into the stomach as opposed to the lungs where you want it to go in and out of. So once it gets into the stomach, it kind of is stuck there and trapped. So we need to get it out and it can get pretty significant and pretty bad. Um, the, the worst that I've personally seen is a, is a, I'll call him a regular size guy. I guess he's my size, maybe, maybe six feet and a hundred some pounds. Um, but a normal sized stomach, um, he ended up having so much air accumulate uh, in that stomach that it looked like he had swallowed a very large beach ball. I mean, it, it, his skin was already starting to stretch. You can see it stretching. Um, that can cause some, some problems um, for your internal organs. It can compress uh, the other uh, internal organs around it and can be very, very uh, detrimental. So getting that air released is gonna be uh, very important. So now pharmacological inventions. So we've talked a little bit about IVs, uh, a needle going into a vein uh, to access and to administer fluids and medications. Uh, the same can be done in a bone, uh, believe it or not. So a, a long bone typically uh, is used, but really most bones would be possible to do this. But uh, the two main sites that an EMS provider would use for administration would be the, the humerus in the, in the shoulder uh, or down just below the knee for a landmark. Uh, typically, they will try to get um, the needle into the bone, and this is done a number of different ways. The most common and easiest I've found is a drill, and it's a specially made drill for this. Um, it looks like a power drill, uh, but it spins and is a little bit less painful. So the insertion of the needle is surprisingly not, as, not much uh, in the way of pain, uh, pretty comparable to a nor normal needle poke uh, through skin and into a, a a vein. However, uh, the administration of fluid into the bone is where the is where the pain occurs. So, uh, if patient is awake, they won't they won't uh, feel a whole lot of discomfort. Although, anytime you're being poked with a needle, it's it's less than pleasant. Uh, but that I/O insertion isn't that painful. But once you administer fluid, your bone doesn't have the ability to to expand and accommodate the the extra fluid or the space that you're that you're forcing in there. Uh, like a vein can. A vein can expand and contract as necessary and you don't feel it or even think about it, but your bone doesn't have that ability. So that's where the pain occurs. So to combat that, you'd insert the IO, attach it just like you would um, to a normal IV uh, solution or, or injection, and uh, you would administer some, some numbing agent first, and that, that definitely helps. So that is IO, or interosseous uh, cannulation or access. Uh, also, we have enteral and parenteral administration of, of uh, medications. So this would be oral administration. So taking uh, like pill form or taking medications uh, and swallowing them uh, or the parenteral route, which is pretty much everything else. So we have uh, other injections. So uh, other than IV and IO, so we have uh, subcutaneous, which is uh, just pulled into the subcutaneous layer of your skin. So just kind of very shallow into the skin. Uh, and then we have intramuscular, which is an injection directly into a muscle. Uh, a lot of times that's done, that's where your uh, shots are normally given in your shoulder and sometimes in the buttock. Uh, you might find a site that um, has a lot of muscle to it. So you're not accidentally hitting a vein or an artery and you're getting it into the muscle. Okay, so there's other routes. Um, and then the IV route as well, we talked about that already. Also, the uh, ability to access indwelling catheters or implanted central IV ports. So this would be surgically placed, um, semi-permanent IV type setup. So someone that is uh, chronically ill, for example, a lot of cancer patients or dialysis patients would be um, prime candidates for this that are getting poked a lot, um, will get those surgically uh, implanted so they can just access those ports especially beneficial for people that have typically difficult uh, IV starts or difficult veins to access. And once you poke a hole in a long bone, you can't use it again for uh, a certain amount of time. And so you're limited if you need to, to uh, have continuous access. So um, those surgically implanted devices, you need to be able to access them. And it does make life a little bit easier uh, for the care providers and uh, the patient as well. They don't need to poke so many times. 
Um, but finding those and knowing how to access those ports uh, are very important. Uh, medic medication administration by IV, kind of talked about that already. And then maintaining an infusion of blood or blood products. So um, being able to administer blood uh, and safely and appropriately and be able to identify problems if they occur and what to do about them. Um, blood and blood products, especially blood in a tra trauma situation, extremely important. Uh, I've been on both ends of it. Uh, I, you'll hear me encourage you to do this again, but donate blood uh, as often as you can. Um, I've been there when we've needed blood and, and not had access to it. It's, it's heartbreaking. And I've also been there when, when a patient's needed blood and has gotten it. And it's, it's literally, I've watched it save lives. Um, so that's whoever donated that blood, you know, saved a life that those times and, and you can do the same thing. So I definitely encourage you to donate uh, donate blood when you can. It it definitely uh, is used and important. And then medical or cardiac care. So they talk about uh, cardiac or uh, cardioversion and manual defibrillation and transcutaneous pacing. So cardioversion and manual defibrillation are very similar. That's where you see um, a large dose of electricity being delivered to the patient's heart. Um, and that the idea behind that uh, is to shut it off and know that it's going to reset or hope that it resets. Um, and we do that with electricity. So a large amount of electricity to tell the heart, hey, stop what you're doing. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. And then when it starts again, we hope that it starts in the right uh, rhythm or the right path. Okay. Um, the cardio version, the difference would be between the cardio version and defibrillation. Defibrillation would, is the timing. Defibrillation, there's no timing. You just do it as soon as you're ready to administer the shock. Cardio version is when you're ready, you have to time it. To the, to the right timing of what the heart's doing. Um, and you have to know that by watching the EKG live as it happens, and then knowing how to sync your device up um, for the appropriate timing. Transcutaneous pacing is still delivering electricity to the patient's heart, but it's doing it at a much smaller scale as far as dose. And the idea behind that is that you're taking over the pacemaker job of the heart. So for whatever reason, the, the heart is not telling itself to beat. Uh, and so you are externally um, for the most part in EMS, um, telling it to be with those uh, electric uh, dosages. The National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians, or the NREMT, is a requirement uh, by most states. And what this is, uh, is a registry of professionals that uh, have passed their qualifications um, to be an EMS professional. So you're able to look up, or employers are able to look up the status of an EMS professional and their training level. Uh, they also provide uh, uniform processes to uh, for the testing purposes, both cognitive uh, and psychomotor, and uh, keeping everyone current. And it also allows uh, EMS professionals to uh, track their education and keep their uh, stuff current. Along with that goes a state license. So the state license will be the minimum that you need to, to work anywhere. Uh, most states, however, do require both NREMT uh, and state license holding. Uh, for a state license in North Dakota, uh, they do require NREMT. So for me to get my uh, North Dakota license, I had to go in and prove who I was with a, some sort of photo ID, uh, driver's license or passport, um, something like that, and then show them my NREMT card that I have. They were also able to look me up uh, on their end digitally to ensure that I had my license. And then other groups that you could be a part of, um, locally there's uh, the NDEMSA or the EMS Association of North Dakota. Um, they're a group dedicated to promoting the profession um, and you can participate with them. There's also some national groups that you can get into that do, do uh, some similar activities. So. Where do EMS professionals work? There um, are more options than you would think, but it is pretty, uh, pretty specialized. But most employment occurs at the EMT level or higher. So like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, any EMR will typically not be um, hired or paid as an EMR. You might be reimbursed as, as, that, um, as an additional role in a, in a different job if you were, say, um, working on a Oil rig is a good example. You might um, you might be employed at the EMR level, but um, typically it's EMT level or higher, and that is because EMT level is uh, the minimum to be in the back of the ambulance by yourself, which I talked about earlier. And a lot of these are uh, employment opportunities 
are for ambulance services naturally, um, and these can be privately owned or publicly owned, as I talked about before, profit or nonprofit, but also fire departments. You could have um, a lot of communities will have fire based EMS. So um, all the ambulances and the uh, fire trucks are in the same area and they're the same entity. So you could be a, a fire, that's where you might hear the term firefighter paramedic. So yeah, they're a firefighter, but they don't necessarily fight fires as their main job. They are in the ambulance that is run by the fire department. They're also able to function as firefighters, but typically if, um, if they're doing that uh, as a paramedic, they're gonna kind of put them in an ambulance because that's their training uh, where they have most of their training. So you could also be employed at a hospital. ERs uh, would be a very good place for a paramedic or even an EMT um, to uh, be paid for their services. Um, that does get a little bit different because your specialty is providing care outside of the hospital or outside of a controlled setting in the transport side. Um, so they might have you function in the ER or function in an assisting role um, throughout the hospital and then uh, have you transport or be a transport expert. So taking patients to or from their hospital. Same with clinics. Uh, you could potentially uh, find a role in a clinic doing some similar type things. And then like I talked before about dangerous or uh, jobs that have a uh, long distance from civilization or from, from any healthcare professional, uh, they might encourage an existing employee or hire one, uh, an EMT, uh, EMR, EMT, AEMT, paramedic, um, to give them on-site uh, medical advice or uh, interventions should an emergency arise. You could also uh, apply for co different contracts. So this would be like wilderness expeditions. So there are some even TV shows, like if you ever watched Naked and Afraid, I think it's Discovery Channel or something. Um, something like that, they need uh, medical personnel out in the middle of nowhere, wherever they're doing their, they're filming their show. And you see if, if one of the contestants is hurt or is sick, typically they have a paramedic um, with wilderness certification and some of those more advanced certifications um, on site to kind of uh, intervene. So that would be something if you're into like traveling and adventure, that something that paramedic or EMT uh, and up could provide you as a profession. So for income potential, EMRs are mostly volunteer status. Um, you could find a couple places that might reimburse you. Some volunteers are kind of reimbursed. They're not called paid just because you end up not making a profit, uh, just because you end up spending so much of your time and, and like even gas money to get to all the different meetings and the emergencies or getting yourself to and from the ambulance space, you end up breaking even or, or losing a little bit of money at the volunteer status, but you don't do it for the money at that point. Um, you're doing it to help your community. And typically you'll see this in real small communities is uh, people that live there will get EMR certified uh, and uh, volunteer for the local ambulance service. And then we have EMTs. So this, this can vary. This can vary depending on um, your location. This is, I think this is fairly accurate for, for local EMS reimbursement. Um, but again, th this can vary. And it also can vary when you're looking at the yearly salary um, knowing that the amount of hours being worked could potentially be significantly higher uh, than an, a quote normal job because of all the, the potential for downtime uh, and really extended shifts. So EMTs could be looking at 13 to 16 an hour, um, which equates to about 27,000 to 33,000 a year. Uh, advanced EMTs, you're looking at somewhere in the 15 to 18 range, uh, which equates out to 31,200 to 3,700. Uh, 440 for the year. Uh, paramedics, anywhere from 16 to 25 an hour, um, which comes out to 33,000 or 52,000 uh, a year. Again, um, years of experience play a role, hours of work play a role, um, and then downtime. A lot of EMS professionals, in fact, almost all of them that I know, work multiple jobs at once. So as you can kind of tell, the, the, the income isn't glamorous. Uh, so if you want the higher income, um, you're going to end up either working multiple jobs, uh, either in the same field or different. I recommend different to broaden your horizon so you don't get so burnt out uh, spending too much time um, doing one thing or in one place. Um, but like I said, most people will have multiple jobs. Um, and it is pretty easy to do that uh, when you're working long shifts. Typically, you'll have you know extended days off. 
So career outlook, employment of EMTs and paramedics is projected to grow by 6% in the next 10 years or nine years or so. Um, I, I foresee it growing even more. Um, this is faster than average for all occupations, but I see it growing even more, especially locally. Uh, the state of North Dakota, as far as I know, almost everybody is looking to hire EMS professionals. Uh, and that's just the ambulance services that I know of. There's uh, even more with the, the pandemic that's going on. Uh, there's been more of a demand for things like testers, um, for temperature checks and things like that that go on. Um, so employment is uh, really readily available in the field. Um, it's a good, it's a good uh, stepping stone uh, if you want it to be for other medical uh, areas as well. So I know a handful of people that um, became EMTs, functioned as EMTs while they were in medical school to give them kind of a, a f um, actual practicing medicine. Because while you're in medical school or some of the early years in medical school, you don't necessarily get to do a lot of the hands-on things and it's, it can be more geared towards um, uh, book work and learning that way. And then emergencies, job security is, is pretty strong. I mean, car crashes happen, natural disasters happen. Uh, unfortunately, we, we can't do a whole lot about those. We can do our best to mitigate some of those risks, but um, unfortunately, acts of violence happen. Um, and, and those things will always require uh, skills uh, of EMS type professionals. So EMTs, paramedics, uh, I think um, job security is very good and career outlook is very good. So if you're wondering what a shift might look like, shift lengths can vary depending on where you're working, uh, but unfortunately they are long shifts. So that, that can become uh, problematic, but it also allows you to have extra days off. So you kind of got to uh, take the good with the bad. So um, I, I've worked all of these and then more, but typically you will work 12 hour shifts is pretty standard, um, but a lot of places will do more. So 24 hour shifts um, are possible all the way up to 48. Um, the longest shift I've worked was 96. I do not recommend going above 12 hours. Um, I've done all of the above. Um, 12 hours is plenty. Um, there, there are certain circumstances where I would say um, that it's okay to go beyond that, but um, there needs to be timeouts available for, for rest. Your, your, the human body needs sleep, and without it, you, you can make some bad decisions and, and you don't want EMS professionals making bad decisions because they're tired. So I recommend the shorter shifts, but that's not always an option. Uh, busyness can vary. So there's there's been shifts. I've worked 48 hour shifts for a long time uh, at Standing Rock Ambulance. Uh, enjoyed my time there very much. Uh, but there's times during that 48 hour shifts when I did nothing. There was not there's no requests for transportations. There was no requests for 911s. It's great sometimes to get a break, to be paid, to basically do nothing. Um, but it can, it can be kind of boring because it's not like you can leave. You still need to be ready and available and, and on call. Or you could be busy for the whole shift. There's been times during 48-hour um, shifts when I haven't had a break to really do anything productive uh, or really rest adequately. Um, that's where timeouts come into play and, and working uh, as a, as a team is very important to be able to say, hey, I haven't slept for you know X number of hours. I need to I need to take a time out and, and rest. Um, that's not always an option, but it, it needs to be. Um, during your downtime, typically you will be allowed to not leave most of the time, but um, typically they will have facilities for you. So you have um, a full kitchen, so you can cook a meal if if you bring food or if you have food available kitchen um, typically there's bedrooms um, so you're allowed to rest and sleep especially uh, during the night hours especially during 24 and longer shifts being able to sleep at night uh, or take naps if you need to during the day during your downtime is certainly um, an option so uh, what i have found out through my 10 plus years now is you never know what's going to happen on a shift you, you just never know it could be anywhere in between nothing happening and being um, constantly running for the whole time but that's kind of part of the excitement of getting into it you, no two days are the same no two calls are really the same and you you constantly get to to learn uh and apply your critical thinking skills uh, and you don't you don't really ever get bored 
So if you're if you're looking to, to get into EMS, uh, the easiest way is to just look up an approved EMS course in the area that you want to be in. So around here, um, you're looking at a couple different options, FM Ambulance, um, Sanford has an EMS education department and they work with uh, NDSES um, for their paramedic program to uh, certify it at the college level. And then BSC also has a college level. So you could potentially find some other um, places offering like EMR certifications uh, or EMT basic certifications. You could find people like potentially uh, my, like myself, I could, if I wanted to, I could put on an EMT basic class or an EMR class um, and, and get people certified. So you might find some private people uh, or smaller services that are that are offering training levels or potentially employers that, that need uh, EMTs to employ um, could offer that sort of training through their site as well. So you just got to do a little bit of searching to find uh, a place offering a course that at your desired training level. So if you do want to get paid, you I do recommend starting at EMT level to get yourself uh, as hireable as possible. Uh, to keep your certification, you will need to continue education, which kind of can get tedious, but um, medicine changes and we learn things and uh, we need to adjust accordingly. Uh, and with that comes continuing ed. So if you're in healthcare at all, you're gonna be doing continuing education. Uh, if you're in EMS, you're gonna be doing more. So EMR, um, you're looking at 16 hours every two years uh, in certain courses that they set forward. There is a little bit of choice, but not a whole lot. You're doing 16 hours of what, of what the NREMT has said is important. EMTs, you're looking at 40 hours every two years to, to maintain your license. AEMT, 50 hours, and paramedics, 60 hours every two years. So there is some cost that goes along with that. So if you're not actively employed as a paramedic or one of those cert certification levels, you're gonna have to pay for it yourself. Uh, but typically, if you are working for or volunteering for a service, they will pay all of that for you, and you just have to kind of make it fit with your schedule. Um, outside of that, if you were like, that is way too much education, I am not going to sit for 60 hours just to keep my paramedic license or whatever, you can't because your schedule doesn't work. You are, or you do have the ability to challenge the written test again. However, that written test can be very challenging. So um, it's not something that you could that I foresee being able, someone able to do, um, waiting two years, not doing much of uh, healthcare or anything, and then taking that test again, it's going to be mighty challenging. It's possible. I do know some people that do it that way. Uh, there is some cost involved with taking the test, uh, but if you pass it, you're you're done in a couple hours, and you don't have to sit through any of those continuing education courses. All right, everyone, if you have any questions or you want any uh, more information or advice, feel free to send me a Schoology message or you can email me. Thank you. Have a great day.